Good evening. We're going to get started in a minute or so. Glad that you're here. Hang tight. We're going to have some fun. It's rum week here at Jack's Instagrams. We're going to have some fun with this. We're going to make a really wonderful drink that you can make at home. We're going to talk about some really incredible rums. We're going to have some fun with it. Thanks. I put on a fun rum shirt today. You know, sitting at home, need a little tropical vibes, need some good spirits right now. So we're in a good day. It's six o'clock. You're on Jack's Liquor Store Instagram. My name is Kevin Brownlee. I am the Portfolio Ambassador with Bacardi Rums here in British Columbia. And today we're gonna to talk about rum. I'm gonna turn this music down. Don't wanna to party too hard. So yeah, thank you for coming today. Thank you Jack's Liquor Store for having me. This is a, a real treat to be able to, to come out here and talk to you, uh, to you all about uh, rum this week. So, you know, quick little uh, rundown on the category. It's a bit of a wild west in terms of the rules and regulations that define it. You know, rum is pretty loose. Uh, rum needs to be made from a sugarcane product. So sugar cane is a perennial grass, grows every year, it's eight foot stalks. Every year you're harvesting it, you get about a seven, eight year life out of one stalk of sugar cane. So that sugar cane, if you fresh press it, you can make cachaça, which is a spirit that's uh, native to Brazil, or you can make rum agricole, uh, which is a style of rum that's made from fresh pressed sugar cane juice. But most rum, as we know it, is made from molasses which is the byproduct of cooked sugarcane juice. It's the sugar that remains. Once you have that, then you're gonna ferment it with the yeast. That fermentation is gonna convert that sugar into alcohol. The alcohol is then gonna be ready to go into a still. Now, the rum category, there's a few different types of stills that we can use. Traditionally, it was copper pot stills, large onionous bulbs. You put your molasses wash in, you got about a seven, eight uh, percent, essentially molasses beer. You're gonna put that in your still and you're gonna cook it. When you're cooking it, you're going to convert those sugars and that alcohol into higher proof by concentrating the flavors in the alcohol. So you're going to run it through a still, you're going to collect it, you're going to run it through again. The next method is continuous column still distillation. And that is something that the, uh, the Bacardi family pioneered in the rum category. It made for a lighter style of rum. Copper pot stilled rums are big, full flavor, big mouthfeel, big texture. Uh, and column still rums are a little lighter, higher in alcohol content, but leaner in flavor. They provide a lot of the backbone. Oftentimes you get combination copper pot, column still blended rums, but rum as a category, there's something for everybody. It is a fun spirit. It's meant to be enjoyed responsibly. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so what we're gonna look at today are a few premium rums. Now these are all aged rums. Rum is gonna be blended. Some blends, some rums have a little bit of sugar added to it after. And unfortunately for a lot of people, they think rum is a sweet, sweet spirit and that's okay there's made from molasses it's made from sugar cane but when you think about the sugar content of rum all of that sugar has been converted into alcohol so what you're tasting is residual flavors from the barrel that it's aged in from the molasses itself some sugar is added to balance out the acidity you know when you take a spirit out of a cask it's going to be really dry it's going to have some heat to it and so to balance out that acidity adding a bit of sugar it's going to lend a little bit of mouthfeel but the Bacardi family Don Facundo Maso Bacardi came over from Spain. They landed in Cuba, went back to Spain, came back to Cuba. This brand is iconic with the rum category. We all know the Bacardi brand of rums, but our portfolio is a little more expansive than just Bacardi's rums. You know, we have Superior and Gold and we have Black. We have uh, a four, an eight, a 10. We have a, a super premium line with some of the Facundo collection. The thing with this rum is that it really represents the spirit of rum. It was a, a fascinating story for the family. But in terms of what they did for the category, they really brought it to the world. They brought rum to the world. Now, this rum is made from column, distil column stills. So it's gonna be a little lighter in style, but it is an undisturbed aging. So what that means is that we're not moving our barrels. We're letting them sit. This is an eight year rum. So the eight on this bottle is indicative of the youngest rum in that bottle. If you look at changing styles and we go over to something like a Banks rum. Now this is new to BC, available at Jack's Liquor Store. And for those of you adventurous rum drinkers, this is an incredible experience because there aren't other rums on the market that do what these rums do. So this is Banks 5 and this is Banks 7. So you see that one is golden, the other is clear. Now, those numbers aren't indicative of the age. They're actually indicative of the islands of origin for the rums that go inside. So Banks 5 is a rum that has, uh, is a rum blend that has rums from five islands. Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Indonesia, and the last one that I'm forgetting that we add to these, this bottle, why am I drawing a blank? Guyana, there it is. 
Guyana actually produces most of the sugar cane for the Caribbean rum countries. The seven has the addition of Guatemala and Panama. So this is going to be a drier style of rum. When you think of drier style rum cocktails, maybe a little bit more spirit forward, something that's going to be stirred down. It's going to be served on a rock or served up neat. Banks five. This is a really playful white rum. It's got some funkiness to it. It works really well in daiquiris. It's nice to add to all types of tropical fruit, tropical drinks, tiki style, very different rums, but five and seven on this bottle, unlike the eight on this bottle, it is indicative of age. This is indicative of the islands of origin. So very different rums. Now, in that we have five and seven different islands of origin, all of those countries are producing different styles of rum. You know, Guyana and Guatemala and uh, Trinidad and Tobago, they're all producing column still. You look at a country like Barbados, a country like Jamaica, they're using huge pot stills. So they're all creating different flavor profiles for their molasses and sugarcane based distillate. What's happening is they're, we're gathering these rums, shipping them back to the UK. They're getting blended and bottled there. So the whole category has an array of flavors and array of styles that you can get involved in. And then for those of you in a very premium mode, we have Santa Teresa. Santa Teresa is a rum from Venezuela. This is a rum that drinks like a single malt whiskey because of the style that it's made. We talked about column stills. We talked about pot stills. Pot stills being bigger, fuller, a little lower in alcohol content, but fuller in flavor. Column still being a little higher in alcohol by volume, a little lighter in flavor. This is aged in a Solera system. Now, the Solera system in the rum category is quite unique. It is a system where you're cascading your barrels. So the rums inside this bottle are between the ages of four and 35 years old. Now, when you're aging a spirit, we know that there's evaporation that takes place. The angel share is something that's really important. And so the evaporation takes place. You lose alcohol, but what you're left with are concentrated flavors. So this is a, a, a blended rum. It's a rum between the ages of four and 35 years. So this is what we're gonna mix with today. So for those of you tuning in, those of you that are still here, we're gonna make a Santa Teresa old fashioned. Or pardon me, pardon me, Santa Teresa Manhattan. So Manhattan, typically a rye or bourbon based cocktail with a little bit of vermouth and Angostura bitters. Today we're gonna make it with Santa Teresa 1796. So as a rum, this is nice and dry. There is no sugar added to it. So it's got a really beautiful character. So I'm just gonna measure out two full ounces, put it in my mixing glass. Then we're gonna use Martini and Rosso's Sweet Vermouth. Now, this is a two part measure to one. So two ounces of Santa Teresa rum, one ounce of Martini and Rossi's Rosso Vermouth. So this is a sweet vermouth. And then just a few dashes of an Angostura bitter. So this is an aromatic bitters. So three dashes of that. We're gonna add our ice. Now, keep in mind too, there's no right or wrong way to drink a cocktail. Some people prefer their spirits on the rocks. Some people prefer their spirits up and neat. At the end of the day, how do you enjoy your alcohol? How do you do it responsibly? It's really up to you. But what is important is to know why we stir and why we shake drinks. You know, we stir drinks. This is all spirits, right? We got a little bit of bitters. We got Santa Teresa rum and some martini vermouth. So this is all liquid that doesn't have any uh, viscosity, like a sugar, a sugar syrup or some juice. And so we want to have that nice, nice smooth texture and finish when we're sipping on this cocktail. So we're gonna stir it. We're not gonna need a lot of abrasion. It doesn't take a lot. I've got some ice here that's just gonna help chill this drink. When you're shaking a drink, if I was making a Santa Teresa or a Bacardi daiquiri or a Banks 5 daiquiri or I'm blending my rums at home to make a drink, whatever it is that you do, and you're mixing something that's got sugar or juice in it, you wanna shake it, you know? Those liquids take a little bit more energy. They take a little bit more to break up and to dilute into the cocktail. And it's okay to have some floating ice on the top of your drink. Not a big deal, but when you're stirring your drinks, just take your time, right? What I do is I, I pull it four and I push, I, I pull it 10 and I push it four. That's where my fingers are doing the work. The spoon's really taking care of everything else. It's not a lot of energy that goes into it. A bit of concentration because you want to put some care into the cocktails you're going to drink. That's very important. And we're good to go. So typically a Manhattan would be finished off with the zest of an orange, 
you're going to use those orange oils to really express some aromatics over top and then you're going to sip your cocktail and get all the layers of that cocktail but i don't have an orange in my house today so we're going to use a lemon sometimes you just got to work with what you got so that there is the santa teresa manhattan to recap two ounces of santa teresa one ounce of martini sweet vermouth and then three dashes of angostura bitters so you know this is a fun way to kind of get you interested in this category. Some people shy away from rum, but don't shy away from rum because it's fun. You know, as a category, it's got so much history. A lot of that history is controversial. There's no denying uh, where rum was produced and where sugarcane was produced uh, through some pretty volatile times in, you know, in history. Um, but it, through, through those struggles, we've come up with this wonderful category of spirit that is recognized around the world. Now, it's hard to grow rum in a country like Scotland or Canada because we don't have sugarcane that grows up here. Sugarcane grows really well on the equatorial belt. In the Caribbean, in Mexico, in Fiji, in India, those types of countries that have a consistent hot weather are countries that are going to be producing sugarcane spirits. Now, for this category alone, you know, there's no shortage of great spots you can get to in the city to go and experience. Tropical drink culture, which emerged in the late 50s, as an homage to some of the travel destinations that people could get to with the advent of international travel and flying was something that they brought back to the United States. Now, we've changed the term. It's not a, it's not a tiki culture. It's tropical culture because, it, because of what, we're, what, we're, yeah, what, what happened in those days. But uh, pardon me for that little tangent. Uh, you know, so this category itself, when you're thinking about it, like when you're sipping any spirit at home, take your time, right? Smell your spirits with your mouth open so that you can have your system to allow the oxygen to help carry those flavors in. Following that, when you sip it, take that first sip, let it sit in your mouth, swallow it, take that second sip, and then you're gonna to start to see those underlying flavors. You know, rum, molasses as a flavor is gonna be big and full. It's gonna have some rich caramel notes. You're gonna get a lot of oak and vanillin. A vanillin is something that comes from a cask, comes out of it. Um, you know, when you're aging rum, because of the climate in the Caribbean, you're gonna lose a lot every year to evaporation. So aged rums, their value goes up because their yield is much lower inside of that cask. So when you're looking at a white rum, white rums, Bacardi Superior is a fantastic example. Now, it is a rum that has been aged for at least a year, but we're filtering that off through a very special filtration system. So that was something that, they, that Don Facundo Maso Bacardi pioneered in, when he was creating his, uh, his Bacardi rums. Now, rums are big and full in flavor, but when you filter it out, what you're doing is you're pulling back on some color, you're taking out some of those heavier compounds to make for a lighter style of spirit. Bacardi Superior is a Spanish style of rum. When you look into something like Venezuela, uh, Venezuelan rum or Jamaican or Guyanese, you're getting into totally different styles of rums. There are white rums available from other brands that are out there, and they're going to be very different. It's just a matter of how the production has happened, but they're all made from sugarcane spirits, typically molasses. And when you find a sugarcane spirit, like a cachaça or a rum agricole, those spirits are going to be a little funkier, a little bit grassier. You're going to get more of those green notes. If that is something that you follow along with at home, if that resonates, you know, green notes like grass and hay, things like that, a little bit of straw, maybe some green tea you'll pick up on. When you start to get those types of notes, you can think about other things that you can play with. Citrus, tropical fruits, maybe you're mixing in some teas. Once you get into things like an aged rum that's, you know, now seven on the bottle, seven islands of origin. The rums in here are between the ages of three and five years old. But stuff like this is gonna still have some of that wonderful grassy note to it, but it's also gonna work more to some savory notes like uh, like Essentia green tea it will play really well with. You can get some lavender tea to work into there. Teas and rums work really well. Think about things that traveled around the world in the 17th century and the, 16th, and the 18th century, and those are the things that kind of fit hand in hand. Now, for those of you at home, quick recap on what we just accomplished. We made a Santa Teresa Manhattan, two ounces of Santa Teresa rum, one ounce of Martini and Rossi's Rosso Vermouth, which is a sweet vermouth, and a few dashes of Angostura bitters. Some aromatic bitters are just gonna kind of layer it in complexity. Think of bitters as a liquid spice. This is a liquid spice that you're gonna add to your liquid, liquid cooking right here that we've mixed up. Uh, any batch cocktail ideas? Great question, Jillian. So, for those of you at home, we're coming into the holiday season. Mind you, it's going to be a little quieter this year. Please play safe out there. Stick to the guidelines. But if you are with your family and you're in that safe space and you don't want to have to spend a lot of time mixing cocktails for people, you can batch a drink. 
the thing to note with a batch cocktail is that, so let's say for example, you wanted to make 10 Santa Teresa Manhattans and you want to have it resting in your fridge so that it's ready to go, it's ready to serve, you just need to stir it down. You can pre-dilute it by adding about three quarters to an ounce of water. But what I would recommend is you measure out, so if we're going to do two ounces of this and you want to make 10 of them, you're going to measure 20 ounces of Santa Teresa rum, you're going to measure 10 ounces of your sweet vermouth, but you're not going to put your bitters in the batch. Because what's going to happen is if that drink is sitting over the course of a few days, a week, which it's going to stay good, it's all spirit, it's not going to go off as long as you keep it refrigerated. The vermouth may change after a few months, but once you've bashed it, you want to add your bitters to drink, to order, because what's going to happen is the bitters are going to change that structure and the flavor profile of your cocktail if it's been batched. So you want to do this to drink if, or to order. So if you were making your batched Manhattan and you've got it ready to go in your fridge, your brother or sister, your mother, your father, whoever it is, says, oh, I'm ready for my drink. You're gonna go into the kitchen, you're gonna pour it. If you've measured out 10, I would add roughly 10 ounces of water for a good dilution rate. It's gonna lower the ABV, it's gonna dilute it, it's gonna make sure that that drink is ready to just serve as is and you don't have to get into mixing it when the time comes. But what that does is you pour it out, add a dash of bitters, give it a quick stir, zest of an orange, and you're ready to go. I'm just gonna scroll up here. I see that there's quite a few questions, so pardon me, bear with me for one moment. Hit or miss, song. Oh, how, oh, I wish we could have an open dialogue. I'm curious to know how that is. Uh, if so, what would I recommend mixing with it? Okay, so, I'm gonna scroll back, pardon me. Pardon my reach here, folks. Happy to see so many folks joining us today. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Jax, as always. Without Jax, this wouldn't be happening. They're so wonderful. That's a little, whoop, uh-oh, uh-oh. Pardon me, folks, I could turn the music up. Do we have, I do not know the answer to that question, uh, Matt Wiseman. Pardon me, any patch cocktails? Oh yeah, I don't know. Best rum holiday drink to make? Oh, you know what? Uh, yeah, Jesse Wood, you, you know, uh, Jesse Wood, yeah, that. <laughs> There's possibility in that. I've had that experience before, not with this rum particularly. And that's an interesting thing. So if, a, if you get a spirit and the spirit is off, rarely is it a, a production thing and it's often a logistical transportation thing. And the reason that is, is because the cork is coming from outside of the distillery. They bottle the spirit, they store it, they transfer it. It goes through customs somewhere, finds its way through America, whether that's on a plane or a train, comes through customs, goes into a storehouse. The temperature fluctuation from the different environments that that cork will have to go through can cause it to change, it can cause it to degrade, uh, and that may be one of the things that affected the rum. So I'm sorry to hear that you've had that happen with this wonderful product, uh, but I can guarantee you that, that it was not the rum and likely the cork or something along the way. So sorry that you've had that happen. Uh, best rum holiday drink to make. Well, for those of you here, still here, next week we're getting together. Uh, a week before uh, the Christmas holidays really pop off very quietly, and we're gonna make some Bacardi Ocho eggnogs. Eggnog season is here. I think that there's only one month in the year where you can appropriately drink as much eggnog as you would like, uh, and that's this month, in the month of December. It's a special cocktail. There's a number of different ways to explore it. We are gonna go, you're welcome, Jesse. Uh, we're gonna go through uh, the recipe that I like to make at home, when I want to make a drink on the fly, uh, but eggnog, spiced hot buttered rum, there's so many ways that you can take rum. Rum oftentimes is seen as a summer drink because it's fun, but aged rum, because of those really nice, rich, caramelized sugar notes and all that molasses character and the spices that come out in it, really kind of play in both seasons. I would say light rum in the summer, aged premium rums in the winter. It's a decent rule of thumb. However you're consum uh, consuming your rum, do it responsibly, pick it up from Jack's Liquor Store, drink Bacardi, take care, get yourself some banks, do yourself a favor, find some Santa Teresa. There's no wrong way to get it. Find out what your flavor is in rum is. The category is so vast and what you can enjoy. But tune in next week and rum old fashioned. Oh yeah, not bad. You know, that's, you know what, that's not bad. Using a little bit of an Amaro 
um, or like an herbal liqueur in an old fashioned is nice. Instead of bitters, maybe use a bar spoon. And that way you're gonna add just some really deep alpine flavor notes. You're gonna get some more bitterness out of it. And bitter isn't a bad thing to have in your cocktail. Rum, is, rum and bitterness kind of play together really well. So uh, for those of you here, thank you for joining in. Jack's Liquor Store, thank you for having me. My name is Kevin Brownlee, Portfolio Ambassador with Bacardi. Please tune in next week at 6 p.m. because we're gonna make some eggnogs. Tell your friends, tell your family, get ready. We're cheers into the seasons. Have a great night. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.